1 Corinthians chapter number 6. We'll begin, we'll begin reading in verse number 11, but verse number 9, he starts talking about those that will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in verse number 11, he said, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, we'll stop reading there for a minute, and then here in a second, we're going to turn over four chapters to chapter number 10, but we're staying in this book, I promise. The Apostle Paul, when he writes to the church at Corinth the first time, twice he uses this phrase that we find in verse number 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Two different times in two different contexts, talking to the same people. First time here, Okay, we can go up and begin reading in the first part of the chapter and you'll find that he starts talking about the hypocrisy within the church of Corinth and the fact that they had ought with each other inside of the church and they were trying to resolve it in the legal courts outside of the church and the apostle Paul said y'all he didn't say this but he said y'all a bunch of idiots that's in the flesh, he might have thought that. But what he wrote was that they were ignorant of the things of God. Why would they subject themselves once again to the knowledge and the judgment of the world? We just read it in verse number you know, 11. Ye are washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our Lord. He said, you were set free you know, from the knowledge and the wisdom of the world. If you've got a problem between yourselves, let somebody that's got wisdom in the church judge it for you. You know, God forbid, Brother Bob, I don't have any money to loan you, but let's say I did loan Brother Bob some money, and if Brother Bob, God forbid, had a flat tire like I did on Tuesday. That was fun. But, and what, hey, I can't pay you back. You know, I, I had a flat tire. Well, me? Okay, that's fine. And then me being me, I'm liable to forget about it until about 10 years from now. Okay? Now, if that were the case, I know Brother Bob. Brother Bob wouldn't ask to borrow money in the first place. Okay? Andy knows that if he did need to, he wouldn't talk to me. He knows I don't have none. Okay? But, if something like that were to happen in the church of Corinth, they'd say, fine, I'm going to sue you. And they would go to the elders of the people, not the church. And the apostle said, is there none among you that have any wisdom? He said, these are petty things. These are squabbles. And what you're doing is, one, you're trusting in the wisdom and the knowledge, not of God, not on the righteousness of God and the judgments of God. You're putting yourself back under the judgment of men, the wisdom of men. He says, there's a better way to do this. And he goes on to say that we are all members of the body of Christ, that we are supposed to be one. How can we be one if we don't have unification. Right? It's one of the things our pastors say. Without unity, there is no unction. Right? If there are division, if there are, you know, even it may not be out in the open, but I mean, if I harbor a grudge against somebody, because for whatever reason, right? let's say Brother Ray accidentally backed in my car and I caught him on the security camera, but he never came and told me. Right? Hey, I've hit a few cars. Right? I can't I can't throw any stones at houses on that one, but I always stayed until the police showed up. Okay, let's say I held that grudge. Well, I, I'm going to treat Brother Ray different. May never say it. May never lay anything down, but I'm going to be colder. Right? If one part of your body is angry at the other part of your body, you're going to know it. Right now, my finger is very angry at me because while changing that goofy flat tire, my hand slipped on the you know what am I looking for brother Peter yeah lug wrench because on mine there's not a lug wrench on both ends one side it's shaped like a chisel don't know why that's dangerous okay I'm sure there's a reason but that part of the lug wrench found my fingernail and then now it's infected it's very angry at me because I just thought meh I'll be alright I'll be alright hydrogen peroxide will be good not good but anyway so I got a band aid on today 
Right? I know when my finger's upset. Well, Christ is the head of the body. He knows when there's problems in the members. But His judgment can sort it out better than the world's judgment can. It may be a temporal problem. Right? It may not be a spiritual problem. It could be something between me and another person physically. But it does have a spiritual impact. And if we get the spiritual problem fixed, right? if we allow God to remove a root of bitterness, if we allow God to change our hearts from what it currently is to what He would have it to be, those things sort themselves out. Because if I'm right with God, I want to do all things as unto God. I'll go the extra mile, not just for my brother, but for somebody I don't know. Because of the compassion that He's birthed in my heart. Right, so that's in context, that's what he's saying when he gets to verse number 12. And he says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. That last part is in reference to the judicial system of the day. Because whatever they said, they would enforce it. In the house of God, you'll find compassion. If people are right with God, you're going to find forgiveness. I'm not talking from God. I'm talking from God's people. You're going to find friendship. You're going to find love. You're going to find peace. You're going to find joy. You're going to find long-suffering at the house of God. You don't get those things out in the world. To be brought under the power of the world is just like we were with sin. It's chains. It's bondage. It's things that you are unable to break. That's why Christ had to break our chains. Right? The law only condemns. But at the house of God, you may have been in the wrong, but it can be made right. right? If I were to back into somebody's car, it would be really hard, because most of the time y'all are gone by the time I leave. Right? By the time we get done in the treasury. But if I were to, right, I'd do everything I could to make sure that it was made right. I got insurance for a reason. Right? Accidents happen. Right? But... You can, you know, I got to make it right. I still got to pay the consequences, but things can be made whole again, just like the father of the prodigal son said, "My son, which was lost, was dead. He wasn't at the father's house anymore. They didn't have fellowship. The son was dead to the father because the son ran away. The father lost the son, but then he was found. He said, "We've gotten one that we thought we'd never get back back again." That being made whole, that is, as the Apostle Paul said, expedient. That the church be able to, you know, that's a whole different story on how the church can handle church's own problems. The right? world doesn't need to tell the church how to handle church problems. God will do that. Right? But we're not teaching on that today. That's not my place. But just so you know, God will take care of it, I promise you. But when God's people start looking elsewhere, because when we're at the house of God, where do we take our instruction from? Right here. Well, if there's a problem, let's see what the Bible has to say about it. Right? Why do you think that our past... It, well, and then he taught me to do the same thing. But why do you think we take and quote Scripture verses, tell you where to find them? Because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to prove it to yourself. Like God proved it to me. We're not trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. We want you to see, this is not man's wisdom, this is God's. Truth sets you free. Right? Well, here he's saying, y'all just getting involved in a whole bunch of quagmire. And back then, if you went to the judge, the judge could look at you and say, you're the one at fault. You're going to prison. If somebody owed you money back in these days, there weren't debt collectors and wage garnishments back in... Roman times. You went to prison. He's saying, y'all are getting angry over little tiny things and causing each other to go to jail over it. What kind of testimony is that to the world? That God's own people are trying to throw God's people in jail. If we can't get along, why would the world want to get along with us? That's the point that he's trying to make them here. He's saying it's expedient for you individually, expedient for the church, but then it's also expedient for the will of God. How can you take a message to the world when they look at your life and say, we don't want anything, y'all a mess. 
You can't even handle basic stuff, let alone eternity. Right? He's saying atonement. Now go over a few pages, chapter number 10. Now we'll say this has to do with a little bit of food, but I'm not going to be teaching on gluttony two days after Christmas. Right? We're all guilty of that. But, verse number 21 of chapter number 10 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Or are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Okay? Different context. Okay? The short story, back in Corinth... If you went to a butcher shop, the butcher would take whatever he could get. If it's fresh, he'd take it. Okay? And then he'd sell it as quick as he could because they didn't have refrigerators. And although they had salt, right, you could keep something preserved for a little bit in salt. But most of the time, in the middle of the, you know, the Middle East, right, you don't have much cold weather to hope that the salt you can bury into a root cellar. Right? They had to get rid of it quick. So the butcher would buy whatever he could get for as cheap as he could get, and then he'd sell it for as much profit as he could. Okay, well, part of the problem with that is Corinth, very pagan, very carnal, very wicked place. They had many gods. And they would go out, and when God instructed them to do burnt offerings in the Old Testament, what did it say? You had to put the whole sacrifice on the altar, and you had to wait until the whole thing was consumed. Okay? Not how the world does animal sacrifice. Okay? Study everything out. There's always something left over when the world does it. Okay? Could be a hind leg. Could be some pork chops. I don't know. But whatever was left over, they'd go sell it to the butcher. The Apostle Paul's telling them, hey, if you go by the grace of God to the butcher and he's got food for you and you've got money in your pocket, just take it and don't ask any questions. Okay, he says, don't dig in too deep on why this was cheaper than the other one. He says, whatever God gives you, be thankful for it. Okay? But then he goes on to say, you start asking questions, and then you may have, he says, for your content's sake. Okay? He's saying, if you start asking, well, hey, what's the cheapest thing you got? Well, I'll take that. Why is it so cheap? Because the rest of it was offered up to a false god well then because you know that you're eating something that was dedicated to a false god and he's saying that's not good for you doesn't edify because if you knowingly do it then your spirit is against the spirit of god you've done something and now you've become a partaker he says just whatever hey this is what i can afford i'll take that and I'll give God the praise for it because he goes on to say that the belly and the food that goes in the belly God's going to consume both of them one of these days it's all going back to the dust of the earth he says if you go to, over to somebody's house and they put something down in front of you right? don't ask what's in it I've learned that lesson a few times okay well what's in that that doesn't sound good but if I don't know I can pretend it tastes like chicken If I don't know, well, hey, maybe that, that piece of gum I chewed earlier, just making things taste a little funny. Right? Like right after you brush your teeth. Orange juice don't taste good right after you brush your teeth. Right? I can convince myself that that's what it was. But he says, but on the other hand, if somebody puts something down in front of you and says, oh, hey, by the, by the way, the rest of, this is the best we got because we sacrificed the rest of it to our idol over there. He says, then don't eat it because you know. They were all in a tizzy of, well, how do we know this, that, and the other? He says, if you know, don't do it. If God hadn't told you otherwise, give God the glory for it. Okay, and then he goes on to say, you know, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Right? What they do in ignorance doesn't have to affect your life. But when you become aware of it, and then you do it anyway, then that's when you're culpable for it. Okay, that's the context. Okay, for instance, 
your boss on the job may be embezzling money, but if you don't know anything about it, you can't be held liable. If somebody were to ask you, uh, that outside of my job description, right? I, I just came in and I did my job every day. I had no idea. But if you find out about it and then do nothing, then you've aided and abetted. That's a crime. Right? Same thing. You know, we, there's a whole bunch of spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a whole bunch of nonsense that goes on out there. Right? But come to find out, well, the person who wrote this song did this, that, and the other. Well, thanks for telling me, but before, I didn't know that. Right? You, you can't prove a double negative. They don't exist. Right? You can't say, well, you should have known the thing that you didn't know and had no way of knowing. So one thing to say, well, you should have known. Now, I've been guilty of that a few times. But should have known something that I had no idea existed? Right? The reason that man's without excuse when it comes to God is because man's own soul knows that there is a God. We can look around and see all that he created and know that there's a God. Man is without excuse. But sometimes we do have the excuse. Well, I didn't know. Right? Or I was out of the loop. He's saying, give God the glory for it, and it'll be okay. But at the same time, if you do know, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Right? Noah wasn't held accountable for the wine the first time he drank it, when he got off of the ark. Because he didn't know that it had fermented. Right? But from then on out, I firmly believe he didn't drink anything that wasn't fresh. But every time he did, he gave God the glory for it. Right? He said, well, now I know. That's not good. So I won't do it. Same thing here. But in this passage, when he says, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Here he's talking about the inward man. He says, when you partake of something that has been designed to be a sacrifice and bring glory to a false god, he says, if you partake it, you condone it. You sanction it. If I were to sit down and eat it, that's saying, I have no problem that this was sacrificed to a false god, if I knew that it was. He's saying, that doesn't edify in verse number 23. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things edify. All things edify not. Okay, so now we get to play the team's favorite game, the definition game. Okay, what's that word lawful mean? Because okay, he said it a bunch of times. In fact, he repeats it twice in both verses, so we've read it four times. All things are lawful. But here, lawful, he's not talking about Old Testament law. Okay, Old Testament law, we can't keep that. Right, Jesus had to come keep the law and then forgive us from sin he set us free from the Old Testament law okay, and the restrictions thereof I can wear a 50% polyester 50% whatever blended fabric this morning and I'm not at enmity with God because of it because he fulfilled the law he sent me free from that that was one of the laws you couldn't wear blended fabrics couldn't wear mixed fabrics I'm either wearing all cotton all linen or all wool can't have pants made as one thing and then the rest of it made from something different. Okay? I'm really glad that he got rid of that part where you can't eat meat and cheese at the same time. Right? Burgers are good. Bacon's great. In fact, that, there are very few parts of a pig that aren't tasty. I haven't tried them all, but the ones I've tried so far, satisfied with. Okay? Right? He's not talking about that law. He's talking about the rights that were afforded them under the world at that time. It was law for, in other words, it was legal for them to sue anybody that they had a claim against. That's lawful for you to do today. You could sue somebody. Doesn't mean anything's going to happen about, you know, with it. But you could sue somebody. You don't have to have you know, this. You, you could sue anybody for anything. It can get thrown out. You may not win, but you could sue for whatever you want to. Right? Then on the other side, I can go out and I can eat whatever I want. I can listen. What I am a free man according to the world. Right? I still, well, according to some people in the world. Some people don't think that I have rights anymore. But 
That's a different story for a different day. Okay, but for the time being, I can go where I want. I can do what I want. I can look at what I want, listen to what I want, see what I want, hang out with who I want to. He's saying what's lawful for us, in other words, what you are free to do by the grace of God in the place that you live. Okay, now, we know that the Apostle Paul, you can go read the book of Acts, the reason that he got to appeal to Caesar is because he was a Roman citizen. He had more rights than somebody that wasn't a Roman citizen. For instance, somebody that was born a Jew but wasn't born a Roman, they were the ones, they were under captivity. Right? They had to, if a Roman came to them and said, carry my load for a mile, they had to by law. If they didn't, they'd either face corporal punishment or they'd be thrown in jail. Okay, they didn't have all of the, but he's, he's saying, whatever your rights are for you to do, just because you can do it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. That's what lawful means. Okay, there's more than one way to skin a cat, so to speak. You can do things under the law, but just because the world says it's okay doesn't mean that God says it's okay. Right? Back in chapter number 6, remember, he said that he will not be brought under anyone, any man. He's saying, God set me free from this world. I'm not going to be limited to just what the world says I can do. He says, I'm looking at spiritual things. Then the second time around, he uses the word edify. But we should know that one around here if you listen to our pastor too often. Edify, that means to build up, to strengthen, right? to make sure. Right? Well, it may already be built, but if the rafters are falling out, to edify means to replace the rafters, put the roof back on. Okay, to ensure that either what you're building, it's solid, or what has already been built stays solid. Okay, that's edify. To sure up or to make up the weak spots. Right? Stand in the hedge, make up the gap. That's edification. Okay, so then, yeah, the longest word out of all of them, expedient. What does expedient mean? Well, to expedite means to make something happen quick. But that's not what expedient means. Okay, FedEx, Federal Express, they would expedite your package if you pay them more money. That's not what this is talking about. You can get it there quicker, but it costs you more. Okay, just because you can do it doesn't mean that you need to. Sometimes it's not always expedient to expedite your package. There you go. That was a mouthful. Right? If it doesn't need to get there for two weeks and they say we can get it there for a week at our regular rate, it doesn't need to be there tomorrow. Okay? A word that goes hand in hand with expedient is prudent. Okay, we've taught on that out of the you know the Proverbs most of the time is when we run into it. But the prudent man is one that has wisdom that God's given him. And it's not just knowing what to do, but knowing the best way for him to do it. Yeah, you can have two different craftsmen. I don't care if they're carpenters, electricians, whatever. They can do the same job, but both of them are probably going to do it a little bit different. Because God gave them both a different set of skills. Right? If the end result is still the same, if it's still square, right? if everything's grounded, if when you flip the switch, the light comes on, right? who cares how they did it as long as they did it the prudent way? They didn't cut any corners. They did it the right way. Everything's above board. Well, one guy may start over here and the other one may start over here. Why do they do that? Because they've done it a few times. They know how it's best for them to do what they're getting ready to do. Somebody else may do it different, but they do it that way. Right? I don't want people trying new things when they come over to do something for me. No, do it, do it the way that works. No new experimental stuff. I don't want the doctor to come in and say, well, hey, we're going to try this brand new thing on you. I'm good. How about you go find about 100,000 people out there and try it on them first, and then I'll let you know what's going to happen. But now in all seriousness, if they did that and God gave me peace on it, I'd be the first one. I don't care. Right? But prudent is not just knowing what to do, but the best way to do it. That's similar to expedient. Expedient means you remove what's in your control 
but you remove all possible obstacles from your way. But you do it before you start. When you say, how you do that? Well, there's people out there, it's their job to troubleshoot before something ever happens. You know what their job is? Is to make the company or to make the project that they're working on expedient. They're trying to prevent delay. They're trying to prevent obstacles from happening. Right? Every now and then you're going to find a bug. You're going to find a chink in the armor. Right? You're going to find something that you have to fix. But the less of those that you have, the quicker the job's going to get done. If you start off thinking, well, how can this thing go wrong? Or how do we ensure that this goes as well as we can? There's always going to be unknowns. There's always going to be things that we can't know. But based on what we know now, how do we ensure that we've got the best chance of success? That's being expedient. You can do something very slowly, but it'd be the expedient way to do it. Expedient doesn't mean that you're doing it with, you know, jetpacks on and you got all the rockets behind you trying to go as fast as you can. Expedient doesn't necessarily mean fast. It means to do it the way that causes the least delay. Okay, they didn't get the uh, Transcontinental Railroad built overnight. But before, long before they ever started laying down track, they had surveyors out there looking and saying, that valley, that's going to be a problem. So we're going to turn here and we're going to go down here. Instead of trying to cross mountaintop to mountaintop, we're just going to go down this slope over here and then we're going to curve back up on the other side. Right? We can't go there because if we start blowing there, it's going to open up a big hole in the ground. So we've got to go around the mountain. We can't blow through that mountain, but this one we can tunnel through it. It was their job to be... It was a laborious and a slow process, but because of the planning of other people, because they went through and they cut out some of the unnecessary burdens before they ever happened, they made the journey expedient. Okay? best I can do with that. So, in that same vein of thought, the Apostle Paul says, just because you can doesn't mean you should. But those things that we do, we should focus on them being expedient and that they should edify. They should make things better, not worse. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to teach just for a little bit this morning, on streamlining your spirituality streamlining your spirituality streamlining a word it means you get rid of all the drag the things that prevent you from going where you want to go okay there's a reason that the drag cars don't deploy the parachute when they take off at the line because that's meant to slow them down not help them go quicker that's after they cross the finish line right if somebody did have one of those out at the starting line they'd go a whole lot slower because they didn't streamline Right, those cars are meant to go as fast as they possibly can and they get rid of all the things that slow them down. Especially them funny cars. They've gotten rid of everything everything that they can and they've gotten rid of most of the frame. Right? There's barely any chassis left. There's so little of it that if you watch it in slow-mo, the whole thing torques at the line. But they did all their research and they said, we can do it and it'll bend but it won't break. They found out just how far they could go, and then that's what they stuck with. Right? Well, how does that apply to us spiritually? Well, the Apostle Paul is saying, first, go back to chapter number 6. We're going to be there in a second. We're going to go a little bit further down. But remember, he said that there are three categories. He said, first, there are those things that are expeditious for us inwardly then us outwardly and then the church collectively right streamlining your spirituality it's just getting rid of all the drag right as the Bible says it's high time that we wake up right it's saying 2021 right if even if it just don't change if things stay how they were the last year End of 2021 is going to be a whole lot worse than 2020 was. Right? Even if nothing changes. If we just got to stay in this. 
right? But the one constant thing is change. Right? Something's going to happen. So the best thing we can do is spiritually get prepared. Cut out all the drag. Get rid of the dead weight. Right? Get to the point that we can stand before God and say, Lord, I'm ready to do it the prudent way every time. Right? If God shows up to your house to do a job and he doesn't have the tools, you're going to get angry. You're probably going to demand a discount. Especially if he wasn't up front about that. You know, there are these things called estimates. That's where they come out and estimate, you know, how long it's going to take them to do it. And then they tell you, based off of that, how much it's going to cost you. Well, we as Christians should estimate in our daily lives. I don't know everything. Right? But I do know if I'm a plumber, I'm going to need some copper eventually. Right? I'm going to need a blowtorch to solder eventually. Right? There are certain things that you're going to need along the way. Right? There are also certain, certain things that you can reasonably expect. Okay? I don't know how I found it. I wouldn't recommend watching it. But there's a guy out in Texas. He's a plumber. And he shows all these videos of jobs that they go out and do. And, you know, unclogging dra- He says... You know, he goes out to a job, he knows there's a good chance there's going to be a clogged drain. So he went and he got all this fancy equipment. He plugs this thing in. It's like a pressure hose, but it's got all these different things. And what is it? It's to block, you know, unblock all the things that you tried to flush or push down the drain that all got caught together. He says, I like this because it means I don't have to do it with my hands. But you know what he does? Every time he goes out to a job, he's got that thing with him. Because he knows there's a good chance you're going to run into a clogged drain there's a good chance that you're going to run into something and if you're going to run into it might as well be prepared for it that's being expedient okay well look with me if you will down in verse number 15 okay know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot God forbid what know ye not how or no know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body for two he saith he shall be one flesh but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit okay now remember God made Adam then he made Eve then it said that Adam knew his wife and it became one flesh right that God would take two and make them one flesh through the institution of marriage okay God made the home long before he ever made the church right well he's saying same still true but he also says just because you weren't married doesn't mean that that's still not true that you become one right well our flesh doesn't have a spirit our soul does that's our spirit but he says just like man and woman can become one flesh he says Same can be true for you and God when it comes to one spirit. I have my spirit, which is saved, it's sealed. That's what's going to heaven. This thing, it's going back to the dirt. Right? But then, he says, Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Then, he also mentions in this chapter that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit indwells us. That's what seals our soul until the day of redemption. God himself put a bit of him in us to make sure that we couldn't lose our salvation. Okay, so follow me here. If the way that God designed it, that, I mean, the Apostle Paul wrote that man's supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, so if that's our golden standard, of what a husband should be. Okay? That means that God desires spiritually for us to become one spirit with Him. That our spirit and His spirit become one. Just like the institution of marriage where He said man and woman become one flesh. And now we're going to pick on Brother Tommy. Okay, Brother Tommy, it didn't say there that two could, or that one couldn't become two again. Right? It's a sad day when you do something and she decides we're not one anymore. Right? When one becomes two and division happens, it's a bad day in Tommy's life. Okay? Because Tommy never has the thought, well, hey, 
where, you know, hey, something wrong with him. He just rolls with the punches. You know how I know that? He's a guy. Right? In his mind, he's like, I'm better with you, so I'm going to stay with you, and no matter what happens. But then Christina, every now and then, he'll do something so stupid that she says, you know what? I'm rethinking this whole thing. Yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah. I, I joke. But just because things become one doesn't mean there can't be division. That's the point I'm trying to make. Okay, so when he says, down in verse number 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. What is expeditious for us is to where, in our minds, I stop thinking about me. That's very hard to do. You got to look at yourself in the mirror, right? I've got to deal with myself. I've got to deal with the thoughts that I have, right? Some of them are pretty out there. I don't know how I got there and really don't know how to get back sometimes. Right? I've got to deal with the impulses of the flesh. I've got to deal with the desires of the flesh. Because he made me a king. I got to rule and reign over it. it means I got to deal with I can't ignore it. But the apostle Paul is saying, in both instances, all of your focus is on you. He says, You're more worried about whatever you think you're owed and suing the other person that you think owes it to you than you are concerned about the church. Concerned about the spirituality of the church as a whole, collectively. He says, and individually, you're so distraught because your soul hasn't become one spirit with the Spirit of God. He indwells you, but you haven't joined to Him. There's resistance there. Every now and then there's rebellion there. Right? Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Because we know that it's the right way. We got saved. And then to go back on that to rebel against it is to say that we were wrong in the first place. you're denying the very God that's holding your soul for all of eternity he's looking at his palms and you're engraved in the palms of his hand and yet you say that his way isn't the right way of course that's going to grieve God of course that's going to cause distress in our life I, I, again it's different for different people I can sit down and figure out how to do something and then you sit down and figure out how to do something and we both get the job done but you may have figured out a different way to do it than I could right you do it the way that makes sense well the same thing spiritually I don't know what it is in your life I know what it is for me right and for sake of time right and maybe a little bit of pride we're not going to go into me okay I know my problems but they may not be your problems right I know the things that slow me down but I don't know yours. You know who does? God. Why do you think he gave us the Holy Ghost? One, so that he'd never leave us nor forsake us. So that we would know wherever we go, he's there too. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. But he said, until then, I'm going to be here with you anyway. He didn't leave us on our own. Okay, and he didn't entrust us to another. He said, I'll take care of you myself. The thing that is expeditious is to get it to where our soul and the soul of God, or the Spirit of God, are one. Now, some people may make the argument, well, that can't happen in the flesh, because I'm still in the flesh. Well, okay. How about we just try and endeavor to get as close as we can? Right, you do understand that, you know, the people that had division for what America would be one day, they knew that they couldn't build it all. They knew it'd take time. Right, you really think that Procter and Gamble of Procter and Gamble thought that the company would be as big as it is today? I highly doubt it. But what they do, they made it as good as they could. You really think that the first, you know, gospel believing Christians that got off of boats in America thought that one day there'd be a church that looked like this in Florence, Kentucky? No. They were just looking for a place that they could endeavor to get as close to God as they could and be free to do it. Because in England, they weren't. And in other parts of the world, they were killed for trying to just live the way that God wanted them to live. All they were trying to do is get as close as they could. They'd say, Lord, I know I'm not perfect, but I'll try and be as close to what you want me to be as I can. 
And the part that I can't do, I'm just going to trust that you can do what I can't. But, you know, he wouldn't tell us to do it if we couldn't do it. And the standard's not, you know, you don't have to spend 40 years in a cave somewhere reading by candlelight to figure out what God wants you to do. Right? It's pretty simple. What's that? Die out to self, embrace the new man. Well, what's that entail? Well, some of them, it's the same for all of us. But other things, it's different. Right? He gives special gifts to people. Right? He gives callings to people. Okay? Your calling may be different than somebody else's, but this I do know. He desires you to be one in the Spirit with Him. Unified. I mean, He only bought you with a price. That's what it says over in chapter number 10. You are. Or no, chapter number 6, verse number 20. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God just didn't buy your spirit. He bought all of you. He said, I want the part that's disgusting too. I don't just want the part... You know, He didn't piecemeal us and say, okay... They're saved, I'm taking their soul. No, he said, I'll take all of them, faults and blemishes, and I'll claim all of it is mine. He bought all of us. So he said, glorify in your body and your spirit. But a lot of people can put on the show, they don't have a problem doing certain things because, you know, it eases their, it makes them feel good. But really, all of our problem, it didn't, what we do we do what we do because where your heart is there your treasure will be also our problem is always in here you know what one of the great joys of prayer is not just you know we can unload our burdens on him because he said cast all your cares on him because he cares for us but one of the joys of prayer is that through prayer I can get my spirit lined up with the will of God in my life prayer is not about me telling God what I want prayer is about you know begging God to show me how to be more like what he wants me to be even those things that I can't put into words he takes those into the throne room of God and offers those prayers up for me right Jesus sits at the right hand of the father making intercession for us prays for us that we become what God desires us to be that we become conquerors through him you know how we do that? Our desires become his desires. Our wants become his wants. He makes an impact on us more than we resist. We yield. We submit. We say, Lord, whatever you desire for me, that's what I want. You know where that happens? Your spirit has to come in line with the Spirit of God. Now you say, well, How's that? Well, I believe that that happens every now and then during revival meetings, but before too long, people start div dividing. I becomes more important than God. Well, I'll just do this once, knowing full well that we intend to do it as often as we can. Right? We pull the wool over everybody up, but all the while, God's saying, what was in line is now separated. may not be much but little leaven leaven it the whole lot little bit all together will defile but in verse number 20 he didn't just say glorify God in your spirit he said in your body there are ways to streamline what you do I'm not saying that I do this often but every now and then God will smack me upside the back of the head and he'll say, why do you do that the way that you do it? Well, for me, it's because once I decide I'm going to do something a certain way, I'm just going to do it that way. Right? It may not be the best way that, you know, for you to do it, but hey, it works for me. Ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay? But in my repetition, there are ways that oftentimes I get so used to doing it a certain way that I don't think about the consequences of what I do or how I do. I'm just trying to get it done as quick as possible. Okay, in doing so, I may overlook a detail that would say, hey, there's something else going on here. Right? It's not just the problem that you saw, unless this gets addressed, you know, unless you do it this way, there's going to be more problems down the road. 
right? Everything that we do, again, hard, may be impossible. But the benchmark is every act that we take in the flesh should be in the perfect will of God to bring glory and honor unto God. You know how I can say that? Because Christ did it. Every breath that he took was in the will of God. Right? Can we say that? Because that's the standard. Right? Never had a stray thought. Now I get it. It's going to be hard. It may not be possible to do in the flesh, but it should be our goal. So how do we get to that point? Right? Well, for instance, you know how many times the Apostle Paul witnessed to people throughout the Bible and just examples that we have? Go and show me where he witnessed to two different people the same way. He let the Spirit guide him and instruct him on what to do. Right? People aren't cardboard cutouts to everybody. We don't expect to be treated just like everybody else. Right? We understand, oh, hey, I'm a little bit different than everybody else. Can I get this curtailed to, you know, the way that I do it? Okay, you don't want to go to the store and buy clothes that fit me. You want to buy clothes that fit you. Okay, well, same is true for other people. Why would we, if we didn't want just a cookie cutter example of the gospel when somebody presented it to us, why would we expect that, well, if I just do this, 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 and this, that'll be good enough. Right? Glorifying God in our body every day, it's a responsibility. We've got to stop and say, Lord, how do you get the most honor and glory out of this situation? Israel glorified God, but oftentimes they didn't give him the glory that he deserved. They tried to make it more convenient for themselves. And by doing something halfway, they did it the wrong way. Because they didn't do it as God said to do it. Streamlining is getting rid of those things that I'm just used to and not taking for granted the fact that I'm imperfect. Lord, cut the dragon. I don't want to do it just because that's the way that I've done it. I want to do it because I know that it's the way you want me to do it. Right? I know that it's a long shot, but I endeavor that every time I get up here, I want every word to be the exact word that God wants me to say at that moment. Right? I know that's a long shot, but I'm hoping that the batting average is getting better. Right? He's still working on me. But why say anything unless it's what God wants to be heard? Why do anything unless it's what God wants us to do in our life? Because if we do it for any other reason, it's all wood, hay, and stubble. Sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Right? We can get up and sing all the songs that we want, but if it's, unless it's the one that God wants to be sung, nothing's going to come of it. It's what the Pharisees said when they looked at Jesus. They said, if it be a God, and the church that he started, they said, if it be a God, there's nothing we can do. Stop it. So let's just wait it out and see what happens. And they were right. If God wants it to be done, he'll get it done. But if the opportunity is there for us to be used to do it, we should not take it lightly. That the very God of heaven could have sent an angel to do it, but instead he desired me to do it. He could just say the word and it'd be done. But no, he desires that I be the one to do something for him. I should give it my very best. Because the thing with things of the Spirit, things with the thing of God or with the things of God, is that no two things are always exactly the same. No two people need to hear the exact same thing from God. It's one of the beauties of the Holy Spirit that one message can be preached, but every person hears what they need to hear out of that message. Because no man has the ability to sit down and write one thing that satisfies the needs of all. Because we don't know all. Although some people tell you that they do. So if I know I can't do it, Lord, I'll do it the best way that I can, the way that you tell me to do it. You're cutting the drag out. Right, well, I'll do it, Lord, but just let me check these emails first. Well, the moment may have passed by then. But, Lord, I'll read that tomorrow. I just need to, you know, de-stress. 
I don't even know what that word means anymore. Life has become stress. Right, right, wrong, or indifferent, my fault or somebody else's, that's just the way that it is. I can either use it as an excuse or I can ex you know, I can become expedient. If stress is going to be there, might as well figure out how to deal with it in the spirit. You think that Jesus' life was a breeze? Right? I find that Satan himself tempted him. Everywhere he goes, he's got people denying who he is. He's the very God of heaven, and people are telling him that he's not who he said he was. Tell me that that wouldn't grieve you in the spirit. But through it all, what did he do? The will of the Father. Not to an acceptable degree, but to the perfect degree. So we should endeavor to do the same. And if we individually did that, collectively as the church, that would grow. It would impact others. Right? And then there's this domino effect. Right? If one person falls over and there's a bunch of people around them, they're going to bump into somebody. Well, what if everybody doesn't fall over? That's between them and God. But the one thing, to be expedient, Lord, get all of me out of the way. Get all of those things that I should have cleaned out a long time ago, those things that I should have dealt with that I've been ignoring, that I've been you know, just pretending that they're out there hoping that they'll go away. Lord, let's get down and let's address it because I'm tired of hitting stumbling blocks. I'm tired of hitting potholes. I'm tired of running on empty all the time and having to stop and get more gas. Right? Let's get it fixed. Because I want to run the best race that I can for him. Right? Streamlining a car doesn't make it go faster, but it makes it easier to go fast. Right? It doesn't solve all of the problems of you know tire wear and engine and fuel, right? it, but it makes it a whole lot easier. Still going to be problems pop up. Still going to have storms. Still going to have daily life hit you. But if you are expedient, if you've edified, then it will make handling those situations easier. You won't have to deal with as many problems because you've already dealt with a lot of them up front. And it will make it easier to identify what the problem is because you don't have to sift through all this wreckage trying to figure out what went wrong. Right? He gave us all the tools. He said, here, this is my will. Here's how to do it. And how many that claim to know him have never read it from cover to cover? Don't sit down and say, Lord, give me what I need to be more like you, to conform to the image of the Son of God. That's what expedient is. And to be expedient, if we get streamlined, there. Streamlined Christians are the ones that turn the world upside down. Because they've removed all the things that could hinder them in themselves and in their immediate surroundings. They remove from those things that they know aren't good for them. And they solely start drinking from the cup of the Lord. And it's their only desire, it's their only passion. And then when they go out, nothing can stop them because their eyes are set on heavenly places. Their heart is in heaven and that's where their treasure is so yeah tire may go flat it's alright God worked it out Santa brought me a new tire I just had to pay for it I did it stink changing a goofy tire with a bad back yeah but I got through it that was the most enjoyable experience no I was actually kind of angry at the time because something in my head brother Bob said mm, you shouldn't change lanes right there Never driven in that lane before. I should have listened. Didn't do it. Holy Ghost tried to save me a tire. It was my fault. Okay? But no, I wanted to get to work quicker, and then I ended up being later. They said, what is it? I need to get streamlined. I need to not worry about, well, if I get there five minutes earlier, I can do this. Well, maybe God wants me in traffic for a reason. Maybe, you know, if I learned the lesson in traffic I don't have to go through what Job went to prove how patient I was I didn't run somebody over when I had the chance to okay I'm being facetious but God's ways are above our ways I don't know what I was supposed to learn 
in the traffic, but I learned it changing a tire. Okay, I'd have rather done it sitting inside of the hot car instead of the cold at, you know, 8.30 in the morning. What's the point? Streamlining gets those things out of the way. Getting rid of all the things that bog us down, that keep us tied to the world, that bring us under the power of the world. And as a result, we can go on victorious Christian living. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.